And I'd like to introduce our special guest right now. And like I said, it wasn't planned this way, for God's sakes, but we're going to look into the mind of those that do violence today. I, um, I'm going to caution you, again, that there's some things here that will be said that could be taken out of context or the wrong way and not to do so. I'll tell you, I think Rory is a brilliant guy, but sometimes maybe delivery, he's more likely to set himself up for that. Um, but I think he's really got this figured out. And you might have to do a little work to get through this one. And you might not want too young of a child to listen to this. You might want to listen to it first yourself before you decide. Those of you who let your kids listen, whether you want this to be something they listen to. I'm going to tell you that there's some cussing in this from his end. Stuff that I usually don't do myself even. I'm giving you a disclaimer on that. Um, but this is an honest look at violence. And with that, hey Rory, welcome to the Survival Podcast, man. Thank you, Jack. Good morning. Hey, uh, you know, it's first appearance on the show with us here, so uh, I've told people a little bit about you. You want to give people just a little bit of your background and, uh, you know, why we got you here today to talk about this subject? Oh, I have to talk about myself in public. I hate that. <laughs> um, just a little bit. Okay, let's see. A little over 30 years in martial arts, a um, little over 17 years working in jail, and that was... Everything from deputy to sergeant to tactical team and tactical team leader, um, mental health specialist. Basically spent a lot of time around violent criminals. Then I got bored and went to Iraq for a year, and now I'm writing books and teaching. So a pretty diverse background, and we're here to uh, talk about preparing for interpersonal violence. And one of the first things I want to kind of have you talk about, you know, based on some of the stuff I've seen on your, your site and whatnot, uh, what is the difference between social and asocial violence. That doesn't sound like something people, you know, generally hear. It's, um, it's not. People have very, very limited ideas of violence, and there are a whole bunch of different ways to describe it and explain it. Um, oh, great. This is cool, because sometimes I can't do this in a class. You ever hunted an animal? Yeah. You ever butchered one? Yeah. Okay. Did you have to get yourself worked up to do it? Um... Not really. I think it's because I grew up in a hunting family and it was a normal course of life. It was just something that I kind of, you know, the way that some kids go off to college and it's not a big deal for them because they always knew they were going to someday. And then I think for others, it's like a big experience. Yeah, you didn't have to convince yourself it was a bad deer. Correct, correct. You didn't have to give it a chance. No, no. And I mean, no, no more chance it. than it already had by the fact that it was a wild animal. Right, and you didn't fight it. No. Okay, and that's the difference between, really, between asocial and social. Asocial, you're getting meat. You're getting your job done. You have something to do. Um, social is all about establishing who's dominant or getting your territories or someone broke what you think are the rules, and you have to teach them a lesson, get things back on track. And so the social tends to have a big show and a lot of communication involved, and it tends not to be designed to really hurt, to really injure people. If you start, you know... Killing people within your tribe, your tribe gets weaker. So most of the things we think about with fist fights and martial arts um, are social violence. They're social adjustment. They have nothing to do with actually killing or hurting anybody. Okay, now you gave um, a pretty benign example to asocial violence than killing a deer, right? I mean, that's not. But I guess uh, my, my question is: is there, is there, you know, let's say dangerous versions of the asocial component? Then sure. And well, when someone can take that asocial mindset into another human being, then they don't fight them either. They just take them out. It's just um, there's no more compassion for you than there is for the wrapper that my sandwich comes in. So that would be an example of, let's say, um, a, an acceptable form of that in our society would be a soldier in a war. He doesn't necessarily hate the other soldier that he's going to kill, but that's his job. That's what he does. That's how he's trained, and he executes that uh, based on training and procedure and just does it like a job, like somebody else would put a box in a truck. The best can do that, but most can't. And that's one of the things we're so wired for social, um, for social conflict and social violence that you do find, um, especially inexperienced soldiers that have to get angry, they have to get worked up, they have to, they have to trigger their emotions in order to fight. And they wind up fighting instead of just finishing things. And this happens in self-defense where, um, there, there's something that's so obvious, I hate saying it, but it's easier to beat people up from behind. Sure. Sure. Okay. That's that's incredibly obvious. How many martial arts practice getting behind people? <laughs> but the only time yeah. I've ever worked with martial arts where somebody's behind you is it's always played up as you're being attacked from behind, not 
here's how to attack from behind. Right. And it's it's one of those, it's not hard to get behind most people, even most trained fighters, and just take them out. But you can teach someone that, teach someone that, teach someone that. And when the adrenaline goes up just a little bit, they'll actually subconsciously switch footwork to stay eye to eye because they're so wired to prove something, to make a communication. How much of that is our wiring versus that we've been taught about this concept of fighting fair? It's really hard to tell um, because it's not just... um, it, it take it from the fighting fair, take that out of for a second. Um, fighting is a form of communication in most cases. You're trying to send a message. If you, if you, um, wanted, uh, same thing, that you don't start a conversation before you shoot the deer. You shoot the deer because you're doing it for food. Um, if you took that attitude to a person, you would just cut throats. There'd be no conversation, there'd be no workup, you'd never see you coming, it'd just be a done deal. Um, because most of the time we're doing it to, to send him a message, you shouldn't look at my girl that way. You shouldn't talk like that. You shouldn't be here. I'm bigger and I'm bigger and better than you are because we're trying to send some kind of message. Um, the person has to see you, and you have that instinct to go eye to eye with them, which is possibly the stupidest way to fight. Sure. What about the person that says, though, my intention is I don't want to engage in the conflict, and the only reason I'm taking this approach is because I have to be damn sure this person's a threat before I strike them. Okay, explain that question a little bit more. I'm sorry? Um, I think I, I misheard a question or I lost a verb or okay, something. Okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me restate that. Then. So the person, what about the person that's listening to what you're saying so far and says to yourself, but the main reason I'm staying eye to eye, I'm paying attention to what's going on, I'm waiting, I'm not coming up behind the guy and hitting him over the head with a baseball bat or whatever. I'm doing this because I'm, I don't want to be the aggressor here. And I am simply abstaining from contact and not striking first until I'm sure that this person is a threat to me and means to act on it. So in other words, this is a lot of people that just take that self-defense attitude of, I'm not going to hit this guy until he hits me. But that does put you at a disadvantage. Where's the balance point uh, there? No. Oh, okay, that's a whole other level. Okay. We're talking about legal, legal self-defense. Um, you have to remember that self-defense is a legal concept. It's not a tactic. Um, and when I teach it, people get into these weird things about that it's complicated. It's not complicated. Almost everything that's super bad that's going to happen is going to happen so fast that you're going to handle it instinctively. The thing is that you've been raised in this culture, so your instincts tend to be perfectly in line with law, um, where people break down, with, with a couple of exceptions. But where people break down is that they are shitty at explaining what they did and why they did it. Um, if I'm going to hit a baby with a hammer, can you shoot me? Yeah. Okay. And Quick. <laughs> if I'm, if I'm going to, right, fast, before I can hit the baby. If I'm going to hit a baby with a hammer, am I an asshole? Absolutely. Okay. So when they ask why you shot me, and you say to save the baby, that defends the third party. When you say because he's an asshole, that makes things look iffy legally. Even if correct, it's true. correct. So you don't think of self-defense as a um, skill at making the decision. It's a skill at explaining a decision. Because um, a good person, unless you're a pathological asshole, um, or your ego is so involved that you need to teach the other person a lesson, uh, you'll tend to make a really good decision, but you're crappy at explaining it, or most people are crappy at explaining it. Um, and that's the thing when you're talking about the balance between a, when you can do a preemptive strike. You can do a preemptive strike when you can explain to a jury why it was the best thing to do, and most importantly, why it prevented a worse use of force later. It's relatively hard to justify a preemptive lethal strike, but it's fairly easy no, I don't want to go so far as to say easy to say I hit the guy and ran because if I'd waited another second, one of us would have killed one or the other. I did damage to save a life. Sure, and to prevent the escalation, and and I left the opportunity for this guy to be apprehended right. or be rehabilitated. So I didn't I didn't end the conflict in a way that ended all opportunity, and I even left a point where if I had made a mistake, yeah, the guy's hurt, but. Uh, it, it, there's there's a back button here. <laughs> yeah, and that's why officers are, can make takedowns and uh, and handcuffing work. You know, the, the low level force, which is really hard to use in most true self defense situations, but you can use them preemptively, fairly effectively. And the justification becomes, you know, I took him down, wrist locked him, and cuffed him to prevent the injuries that would have happened if I'd let it escalate to a fist fight. Which is, I can explain to a jury that that's where it was going. Sure. So. With this concept, then, what we're looking to do is figure out when we're the target. So are there keys and ways that people 
can tell that they're being targeted for what purpose they're being targeted. It, yes, and people know it, and they do this instinctively, and then because they're so used to the social stuff, they come up with excuses that they think that they're misinterpreting things, and they let themselves be victims. So um, the first thing, you got to know what normal is. And um, there's a normal distance we stand. It's different in different cultures, but there's a comfortable distance that we stand. Um, you and I have never met in person, so if I was saying, hey, we'd probably stand at about three feet apart. Does that sound about right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. If um, if we knew each other better, we'd be standing about a foot closer. Yep. If we knew each other really well, we'd, we're comfortable standing really close. And if you ever see two guys, they're standing almost touching chest, but looking over each other's shoulders, they both did yard time in prison together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're looking over each other's shoulders, not making direct eye contact with each other, covering each other's back. It's a really specific body language. Interesting. So we've got the so we've got this three foot this range that we know is comfortable. Okay, if someone wants to violate that, that's a red flag. Um, if someone is talking to you, they'll be talking to you face to face. And if you look at their feet, their feet will be um, the second I'm not not whether they're parallel or perpendicular to you, but basically their their shoulders, hips, and feet will all be in a line facing you. Got it? Okay. Okay. Someone who wants to hurt you is going to put their their feet um, in a line towards you, so their power is towards you. If you see someone standing like that, it's either a bad guy or a cop. Okay. Okay. The second piece of that is that that comfortable distance is only face to face. It's much more comfortable side to side. I could stand six inches off your shoulder to the side and not trigger the creepy feeling that would happen if I tried to stand two feet in front of you from the front. Absolutely. Absolutely. That that guys know this, so they try to flank and they try to make it look like they're starting a conversation. That also puts their lines, their feet in line with you, their power line in line with you. That's okay. So the things, if it's social, if this is going to some kind of social conflict, you'll see it coming a mile away. Um, There are a handful of ways. Either it's a monkey dance, which is the what you looking at? Oh yeah, who are you? And then they stand up and they puff and. They get closer and closer. But if you look at the body language of that, they're trying to look big like cats puffing their fur out. They'll be up on their toes, bouncing, they're flexing, their feet are squared up, and their their energy, we call it their energy is high, but basically they're up on their toes, which is like the stupidest possible way to stand if you really want to fight. But it's like a primate instinct. It's, I'm bigger, look at me. It's in it's, the shoulders right. up. And I mean, like when I studied Sistema, you know, one of the first things I thought, never ri- raise your shoulders. It's a, it's a clear indicator of, of a response. Right, and we are all trying to impress chimpanzee females when we do that. But the actual human women tend to look at that and say we're immature and stupid. The chimps would be really <laughs> impressed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you want to impress a chimpanzee female, you can you can yeah. puff out like that. But if you want to be common sense, then that's probably not. It. And it, it 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 gives away. And I think one of the, my things with what I've always tried to work with people on confrontation is don't give away anything before you absolutely have to, about your capability, your intention, what have you, because that doesn't let your opponent feed off of you. There, there's no advantage to other people knowing what you're thinking. But anyway, okay, so you see this, and you'll see it coming, and there will be a verbals with it. They will talk. They will do this stuff. It won't be the disarming kind of verbals. It's the establishing dominance kind of verbals. They're only, for social violence, it breaks down a couple of ways. Monkey dance we just mm-hmm. talked about, and you've seen that with almost every fifth fight you've ever seen. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You see that in MMA, the two guys get in the ring and start doing that crap before they're going to have a professionally controlled and refereed fight. So right. well, if it okay. happens there, it's going to happen everywhere. Yeah, a lot of martial arts are stylized ways to do this. Um, they're dueling systems. It's not the same as self-defense systems. Um, so monkey dance. And, that, that will, and then it'll escalate to the point where one will either, you know, poke the finger on the chest, push the chest, flip off the ball cap, and then it, and then that could be repeated back and forth a couple times. It'll be a you know hard overhand right, which is way more likely to hurt your hand than it's hurt the other guy. And a whole bunch of sloppy punches, and then they'll be tangled up and probably fall down and rest on the ground. If someone gets hurt doing this, it's because they fell and hit their head, or they broke their hand on the other guy's head. Um, so that's the monkey dance. The um, the educational beatdown. Um, every group has rules. The rules are always enforced. If it's a group that uses violence, then they'll enforce them with violence. For the most part, it's uh, not a big deal. Uh, you and I, if we know each other and you screw up, I can look at you and you'll be self-fixing. No matter you screwed up. You'll, you'll, I'm, I'm sorry, it won't happen again and we're, we're done. Um, if it's a different group, I, have you ever seen NCIS? Uh, a couple times. 
Okay, I was raised redneck, smacking people in the back of the head when they thought that makes total sense to me. <laughs> I, yeah. I try not to do it. It's not my, you know, it's not where I live now, uh, but it makes perfect sense. But there are rules to it. it it's always upper status to lower status. Um, parents make kids, kids don't stay parents. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's the educational beatdown, and they can go lethal in cultures where that's allowed. Um, interesting, can I go off on tangents? Yeah, a little bit, sure. <laughs> Um, almost every group has a uh, maximum level of punishment, a maximum sanction. Okay, uh, most families, a point where they say, oh, he's had enough. Even, even no, the, um, the, the co-conspirator says, hey, you, you, we're done. No, the, the, this is the worst thing that we do in this. In this, this is the worst thing that happen. You know, in some, in most businesses is being fired. Can, they can dock you pay, they can dock you time, they can do this stuff, but the, their bad one is you're fired. Okay. Most families, it's a spanking. Follow that so far? Yeah, I got you. I got you. Okay. So, um, but there are steps to a spanking. The kid has to break a rule that they knew was a rule. Um, so it almost never happens the first time the kid does it. If the kid does get spanked, it's because they did something dangerous, like running in traffic, and there's no time to turn a conversation. Um, the kid gets to say their piece. You ask him, why did you do that? And if the kid gets all defiant, I did it because I want to, and you're a bad daddy, I do what I want, I would totally get spanked. <laughs> if the kid sucks up and is like, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. I just forgot. I, I, I promise I'll be good. Then usually they'll just get sent to your room. It'll be commuted, right? Sure. And the last step before the spanking is the um, the speech. You know, the you know, I don't want to do this, but we have rules in this house, and you knew that this would happen. Okay. Do we skip any of those steps in state execution? I'd say we have more steps in a state execution. But all of those steps are there, or it doesn't feel valid. Correct. Correct. We don't apprehend the guy, even if we saw him do it, 10 people saw him do it, we don't apprehend him, lay him down the street and shoot him. No, you have to go through the steps or it doesn't feel legitimate. And it's the same thing for firing, it's the same thing for spanking, it's the same thing for an execution. And the point of that is that the social violences are all scripted. Unless your ego gets sucked up to the point that you're playing a role instead of watching it, um, you can predict everything that's going to happen and you can prevent anything you can predict. So, um, avoiding the monkey dance, what you're looking at, is just, oh, nothing, dude, I was just feeling I was sleeping, didn't sleep last night, I was just looking out, sorry about that. No monkey dance there. You aren't giving them the hook. Most educational beatdown, you know, you need to apologize to that lady, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was being rude, that won't happen again. If you want to um, escalate it, then you tell them that their rules are illegitimate. As I overheard a guy in Turkey say, is, uh, he was British. Um, well, okay, if you want, but we don't do it that way in civilized countries. And that was making friends and influencing people right and left. So, anyway, the social stuff is very predictable. There are a couple other categories that we see in. The thing with the asocial, it's all about resources. If someone's targeted you, they've chosen you for a reason. And this is getting into the logic of violence. You want me to keep rambling? <laughs> I don't think you're rambling. Keep going. Okay. Um, there are only a couple of breakdowns. Again, there's the social stuff, and you can see the logic to it. If someone thinks you've broken their rules, they'll try to correct you. Um, if they're polite and civilized, they'll correct you in a polite and civilized way. But most polite cultures, they just you know, don't make eye contact and, and start snubbing you until you bring your behavior in line. And within the cultures where that's allowed, that's usually all that's required. Um, the social violence tends to break down one of two ways. It's either about resources or it's because they like it. The resource thing, okay, here's a question for you. If no one was going to help you and there was a very real possibility that your kids were going to starve, what would you be willing to do? I think I would be willing to do pretty much anything to make sure that my kid didn't starve, uh, as hard as that is to say. I think that I would do everything I can to stay within certain bounds of my own ethics and morality, but in the end, my kid's going to eat before your kid eats, if if only one of them's going to eat. If, if, I can, if I can make it work, I will, but... There is a point at which my family comes first. Good ethical answer and honest. Um, we put that out to a room, and when they, people say everything, but we sit there and, you know, no, be specific. Would you steal? Would you rob? Would you murder? Would you band together with others? Um, one of the ones that doesn't come up, but it happens all over the world, would you prostitute one of your children's feed your other children? And it happens all over the world. It's more common than killing for food. So you, you get a group of people to work out this list, and you will not find anything on that list that people have not done for drugs. The addiction and drug culture drive most of the violent crime in America. And if you can't imagine getting the head of someone who's addicted, if you can imagine what you do for your kids, you've got to feel, a little bit of a feel, about what can and can't talk them down. Can I talk you out of getting food to 
getting money or food to feed your kids. No. You know, by talk you out of using violence. Put the gun away, here's some money. It, it depends, right? You can talk me out of using violence. That is a very it depends answer. If you you can talk me out of using violence to feed my kid, if you can show me a way to do it without violence. No, that's what I mean. I can do just put the gun away. Here's the money. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah, and most of self defense advice based on that. If someone shows you knife and asks for your wallet, what do you do? Give me your wallet. Sure. That's based on this level of violence because it's about the wallet. It's about the money. See, I have a problem with that. I think you do too. Because I was just talking about this last week on the show about how where people comply in these situations and then the guy with the gun that says, just give me and I'll go away. I know of one instance where the guy leaned across the counter, was a young girl, 19 years old, working in a convenience store, pressed a 45 up under her left eye and blew the back of her head off and turned around and walked away, even though she gave him every bit of compliance. And that's where we get to the second level of predator. And those are the ones that just enjoy the act of violence. And there is no win-win when one of part of his definition of winning is seeing you begging and bleeding. And are there keys that we can determine which type of person we're dealing with? Um, within those two, they use almost exactly the same tactics, almost exactly the same strategies. So what happens is when you set your line and it doesn't work is when you know it's not what he was presenting it as. And this goes back to the whole first design, social and asocial. There's the stance, there's the position. We know what normal is. Normal is how close people normally stand, whether their feet are parallel to us or perpendicular to us. Once you consciously know normal, then you can consciously recognize abnormal. Once you do that, and one of the other reasons why I like working with um, having people practice articulating self-defense is one of the biggest issues with most people that become victims, in my opinion, is that they know what to do, but they can't make themselves do it. They don't give themselves permission to do what they need to do. And one of my tactics is if you in your own head can explain it to a jury in the second you can explain it to yourself enough to let yourself do what you need to do so you really the most important skill is being able to read people in reading situations so the first division reading between um social and asocial is actually fairly easy except we're so wired to assume that everything is social but once you get over that those are fairly easy to read um understanding the difference between a process predator um sorry process predator is the kind that of, it enjoys the act um and a resource predator, it's basically if you comply and you do not, he doesn't immediately try to get out of the area, that's wrong. It's going to go bad, very, very, very bad. Yeah, the guy that says, hand me the money out of the register, and you've given him the money, the second he has the last penny, he should be 86 in the AO, and if he doesn't, right, things are not what they were It increases there. the chance of getting caught. It's, um, it's a math. It's a um, very mathematical with the more sophisticated guys. Guys in the first robbery tend to be amateurs. Guys have been doing it for a while. It's a very um, subconscious but pretty detailed risk-reward analysis. Okay, the longer it drags out, the higher the risk goes. With the process predators and people enjoying acts, sometimes they have to drag it out. That's the point. It's not quick stuff. So um, if someone is monkey dancing with you and there's no audience, is that right? No, it's absolutely not right. Unless unless they're doing it solely to intimidate you. Right. But this is, you intimidate people for an audience. But if he's right. looking to keep you in the mindset where you think that this is a monkey dance, so all that's going to happen is, you know, you're going to push each other's on the chest and punch a couple times, and he wants to do it privately because that audience magically turns into witnesses when it's predatory. If he can keep you in that social mindset, you won't fight effectively. You'll fight stupid. You'll do the big monkey dance up on your toes thing. <laughs> Where is he? And he will just take you apart, and he will enjoy it, and he will giggle about it, talking about it with his friends over beer later. This is what he does for fun. So is it this mindset that, that leads people that know something's wrong to just lock up and freeze? Yes. It, it's a lot of uh, – the freezing is a whole other issue. I mean, it's, I mean there, there's a lot going on. There are a whole bunch of – I want to say there are different ways to freeze, but it really breaks down to one way. Um, but there are different things behind it. Um, first thing, everybody freezes. If, you, if you're honestly surprised, which that guy will work too, the minimum freeze you're going to get if, you, if you've been in 100 fights or 100 operations um, is a switching gears freeze. Just, just going from I'm on patrol to you know, taking fire counterattack takes a, a gear shift. It's small. The, the longer you've been doing it, the smaller it gets. Most people will never see it, but there's always at least that freeze. But when you get to people that have never experienced it before, there's a whole bunch of them. There's a, sometimes the, the words running through your head make you freeze. 
Um, I don't get this one, so I left it out of out of uh, Face and Violence, the book. But this isn't happening. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. It's really common. The two freezes I get that are close to it, um, I need a plan, which is one of the signs of an amateur. If you need a plan while you're taking damage, that no, you need to be moving if you're taking damage. Planning is for when you aren't taking damage. And if you freeze in that, trying to come up with a plan, by the time you've got a plan, you'll take too much damage to execute the plan, so you're screwed anyway. And the one that really um, irks me is the why is this happening freeze, because even if you had an answer, it wouldn't matter. But the guy wants drug money, enjoys beating people up, or, you know, he wasn't properly toilet trained as a child, does not in any way affect what's happening in this second. So those are those are some of the mental freezes that happen. Um, one of the biggest, I call it the looking glass freeze, because when you go into violence for the first time, when something really serious happens, everything you thought you knew about the way the world works is shown to be completely false. Um, you do a, a whole bunch of stuff with shit hits the fan scenarios, and people have these assumptions. They don't. They've been raised in a society where hundreds of unseen people are taking care of them all the time. They have electricity. They have hot running water. Food gets to the grocery store. They don't really know how. Um, and people that are raised that think that that's natural. They don't realize that it's an incredibly unnatural and takes a huge amount of will and effort to keep it going. In an interpersonal violence, you find out that everything you know about how people interact, how they think, how they talk, how they treat each other, is also completely unnatural and a huge act of will to maintain. I'm saying it just sounds like you're basically describing two totally different viewpoints into normalcy bias. It's, do you really think they're that different? Or are they just on different scales? I don't think they're different at all. I think that I'm just saying there's two different viewpoints into normalcy bias. Yeah, it's scales. There's the normalcy of our, our big world, and there's normalcy of how two normal people talk and act. And um, just because they're normal to us doesn't mean that they're natural or universal. I completely so agree gonna, with that, yes. Okay, so when it breaks down, when someone just attacks you, someone has decided that they want your stuff, someone, whatever it is, um, that's not the way normal people behave. And there's and the people go, that's not the way people behave, then their brain goes into, is this a person? And they realize that nothing that they know applies here. And what almost any biological organism does when it doesn't know what's going on is it will freeze. You don't know what will make things worse. You don't know what will work. Yeah, one of the things, that until you've been really, really adrenalized, uh, most people have no idea who they are under those circumstances. Your brain's not the same. Your body's not the same. Your perceptions aren't the same. You don't think the same. And so they have a body suddenly and a mind of their own that's totally unfamiliar to them with someone trying to do things to them that's totally unfamiliar to them, and they freeze. And sometimes, and it's one reason it stays in the gene pool, is, is way too often freezing works. Um, but you have to be able to make a conscious decision that this is not the time for freezing. I need to do something and execute it. And that is incredibly hard. Um, I'll tell you the secret with the caveat that I have absolutely no idea if just telling someone helps. Everyone I've ever debriefed, all my experiences, the same pattern. First, you have to recognize that you're frozen. And it's hard for some people because for the most part, it's not an unpleasant feeling. You don't feel scared. If you get a warm kind of floaty feeling and you hear the ocean rushing in your ears and you're having these very, very stupid, although they won't seem stupid at the time, crystal clear thoughts, you're frozen. And the people I've debriefed that were most in denial about being frozen were saying, I was thinking too clearly, I couldn't have been frozen, I wasn't even that afraid. And they stood there while their partner got hurt. Um, once you realize that you're frozen, it will be an immense act of will, but you have to tell yourself to do two things. I don't know why it's two things. It's not three, it's not one. Um, and it doesn't matter what the two things are, except they have to affect the world. Yell, hit the guy, grab something, grab a weapon, that you have to do something. You have to tell yourself to do a second thing. Hit him again, use the weapon, rack the round, you know, change position. And for some reason, um, after you've done two things and your hind brain realizes that, well, that hasn't got you killed, it will relax a little bit and let you start using some of your training. Is there a place where sufficient training causes almost those things to happen simultaneously? And what I mean is I've, I've had that experience before when I was taking action, uh, where you're almost on an autopilot, where it's just what you do in the situation, and even though you're, you're scared or frightened or locked in some way, the body's still moving and doing what it knows from muscle memory and just countless repeated trainings. My opinion is that um, you can condition it, you can't train it. Okay. Um, 
And one of the things is you can't condition complex responses. So you've done, I don't know how many times you've done an immediate action drill, but you'll do immediate action without thinking about it. Your body will start it before you consciously realize your, your weapon's jammed. Correct. Okay, that's conditioning. That's conditioning. Um, they'll tell you it takes, you know, three to 5,000 reps to learn a new skill. It only took one rep to learn how to not touch a hot stove. Sure. Sure. Okay, that, that's the difference between... <laughs> And that's the difference between training and conditioning. And if you can condition to that level, you know, you can, and it doesn't take a lot of reps. But if you condition that level, it's like you can draw, you can draw and engage, you can do immediate action, you can do um, what I call counter assaults, which are a flinch that hurts the other guy. Um, but you can't make complex decisions like that. You can't come up with plans. So if your training is based on seeing what's coming in, coming up with an appropriate response, working some strategy, working some tactics, that will tend to fail you under close assault unless you've been there a bunch of times. And once you've been there and you've kind of got it down, then you can do all the stuff you've trained at a really, really high level because you're using the adrenaline instead of having it used against you. But I have never seen a training that got someone to that stage in their first encounter. Okay. I'm almost thinking maybe of a different mental state then. The state where the person says, I just did everything I was supposed to, everything seemed like it was in slow motion. But a person that was watching that person said, I can't believe the, how quickly they reacted. So that might be a completely different seen, state. It is. And that's what I'm talking about. But I haven't seen it happen to someone the first time. Okay. It's, um, that, there's a, a threshold. One of the, in um, Training of the Speed of Life, Ken Murray's books, he made the statement that ACE, the U.S. Air Force uh, said ACE at five kills because all the research said that no matter how good the training, no one at all remember their training for the first three to five encounters. Wow. You get through your first three to five, like going to the Air Force on luck and instinct. If you hit that threshold, that three to five threshold, and then you would have the luck, the instinct, and all the training. And it was very, very rare for an ace to ever get shot down. So once they got there, they were using the instinct combined with the training. Combined with the training, and they became really, really formidable. So, so what do people need to know about this? I mean, how, how, do they, how do people take all of this information, this psychology, and make it into something that's concrete for their, their, their lives? Um, in everything that you ever do, the most important part is awareness, right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, but uninformed awareness is just not awareness. Okay. So it's not just, you know, the, the, if you want to go vague with I had a bad feeling, then, then cool. <clears throat> but if you can explain the bad feeling to others and yourself, then you've got your conscious mind and your unconscious mind working together. Um, if you recognize, if you practice studying to recognize normal, you can recognize abnormal better and explain it both to yourself and the jury. The, um, everyone can benefit from getting better at reading people. It's um, Everyone will say the words, but you look at their bodies, you look at their faces, and what's the message this guy is trying to send me? And once you realize that he may not even conscious rec consciously recognize what he's really trying to say, but once you can figure out, you can manipulate him on that level instead of the level that he's trying to turn the conversation into. So this, um, the whole psychology of it is huge, and we all do it instinctively. Um, what, you, what I suggest, what I want everyone to do, you know, get the training, get the, you know, train with me, whatever, but start moving it consciously because subconsciously you tend to not get better at things. You get good enough. Consciously, you can continuously, continuously improve. To answer the question, I just dodge it really, really well. <laughs> it's, I think it's a little bit of both. I, I, I'm looking for maybe some concrete actions. If somebody said to you, uh, I now feel exposed by this. What, what are some things I should do in my life right now and over the next couple of weeks to get myself more prepared to deal with this potential reality? Because part of why we have you on, on the air here is, yes, this stuff happens every day to a small number of people. And I know if you're in the corrections industry, it seems like it's a huge number of people, but the reason people walk around with their, their head in the clouds is because it is a relatively small number compared to the whole. Yeah. But we it's teach people, people in this time. world that, that there's a thin line that maintains that, and there could, be, there could come a day where this is a hell of a lot more common, and we want people to be prepared for that period of time. Well, I mean... Um it used to be normal. You know, 200, 250, we, we talk sometimes about human brain, monkey brain, and lizard brain. And two, 200, 250 years ago, you were in danger frequently, uh, whether food, flood, starving, disease, raiders, and people got to know that deeper part of their brain, and we tend not to. 
So for some suggestions for drills, um, go to public places, do it instinctively, don't try to use your brain too much, and start picking out the weak and the vulnerable. Start picking out the ones if you needed money right now or you wanted to cart off somebody, who would you pick? And then where and how would you do it? How would you get them alone? How would you get psychological dominance? Don't worry about the physical dominance yet. How would you get psychological dominance? That's the first rule is watch people like they're prey. Because someone is watching you like you're prey every time you're in a crowd. Um, and while you're doing that, look at the ones you absolutely wouldn't fuck with and figure out why. What is it about them that tells you um, this would not end well? Um, let's see, there's another drill I don't say very often. that something you just said triggered, and it fell out of my brain. That's what happens when you have this many concussions. Um, whenever you get an intuition, this is another drill. Whenever you get an intuition, you get a hunch. You know, you're sitting in a restaurant, and that couple over there is going to argue anything. Um, you figure out where it came from. As long as it's safe, you sit there and you replay it back in your mind, what you heard, what you saw, if necessary, what you smelled. It gave you a clue, and you pick out where the clues were. For your legal articulation for self-defense, it's incredibly important because most of those decisions will be made very quickly and subconsciously. And having practice at explaining a subconscious decision is hugely important for that. But more important, once you start realizing that these hints are coming from information, the, the deep part of your brain is processing faster than the conscious part of your brain, you'll start trusting your intuition more. Once your intuition starts realizing you trust it more, it will start kicking you more stuff. And you'll actually start living in a different place in your brain. You know, I've got a great, ana- I've got a great analogy for that, for people to understand it. Okay. My father-in-law has a hard time hearing, a very, very hard time hearing. We finally convinced him to get hearing aids, these new, highly advanced hearing aids. When they put them in his ear the first time, it was amazing how much he could hear, but they did not give him full correction of what was possible because they said he'd lived this way for so long that it would overstimulate and be too much to handle. So over a a period of several weeks, the gain on these hearing aids slowly increased so that the mind could process the information it had lost touch with. That's exactly what you just described. You're asking your, 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 your subconscious and your consciousness collectively to give you more information. And the more you're able to process, the more it will be willing to give you. But it can't go from zero to 60 in, in, in a half a second. It has to be conditioned in. It has to be developed. Excellent. Yes. Yes. And that, okay, and you just remind me of the other drill. And this is, I think I can only uh, suggest this with your audience. I can't do it with most people. But go get cold and hungry for a while. Um, go off and don't eat for long enough that your senses start just shooting up and you start smelling hamburgers two miles away. Um, start getting into that part of your brain that starts triggering when you're hungry. And that's really close to the part of your brain that gets triggered when you're scared. It's um, get to know yourself, get to know that part of your brain. And the third drill, do something physical that involves shoving around sweaty, nasty people. <laughs> it's, I, I like judo for that. Okay. Um, the judo, wrestling, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, don't fall in love with it, especially the grappling. It's really easy to fall in love with. Um, and you don't grapple to grapple. You always grapple for something else, to handcuff, to escape, or to disable. Um, it should never be dragged out. It shouldn't turn into a chess match. Which is one of my problems with the sport when it becomes a, a, a viewpoint of self-defense. And you've got these people rolling around on the ground together. And I, I respect the physical development. I respect the skill. I respect the sport of it. But in trainings we've done, we've had people, you know, put them into scenarios and let them spar like that and roll around the ground. And I've walked up to them and, and, and tapped them on the forehead with a training knife. Yeah. And, and, and the reality was they never even thought that, well, while well, you're doing this, right, his buddy uh, over here is going to put a knife in your kidneys. And that's what makes it a perfect example of that social because those are what's being demonstrated there are exactly what would impress a chimpanzee female. <laughs> strength, and, strength and endurance and flexibility and, and even some tactical sense. Um, and it's not it's not that there's nothing wrong with being strong and flexible. And I will say that everyone needs a little bit of grappling if they want to go physical because it's they're the premier teachers of how to move a body. And moving a body is one of the critical skills. But it's really easy to fall in love with. And um, once you fall in love with it, you start doing it for itself instead of for your goal. But um, my point is you want to get used to going hands-on with people that are kind of icky. Okay. The, the 200-pound, sweaty, hairy guy, you want to get to the point where you don't even flinch when it's time to, to bury your head in his armpit and throw on. 
once you get past that point. It's the same thing. You want to practice something where you take impact. I don't think boxing is not good for you. Micro concussions are horrible. But I think everyone should box until they aren't afraid of getting hit anymore. Then they can walk away from it. But you need you need to get that exposure to impact, not be afraid of it. And just and a lot of a lot of the basic training is is pick the things that scare you and go do them until they don't scare you anymore. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. That's. That's, I, as I mentioned before, I, I've done quite a bit of work in training with the Russian Sistema, and getting hit is a big part of it, and learning to absorb blows. But it's not theatrical, like, look at me, I can get hit 15 times and stand here. It's taking away the fear because the the concept is, in a fight, you're going to get hit. So you're going to have to be able to deal with it. The best training I think I ever had for real fights wasn't martial arts. It was high school football. <laughs> yeah. Because you learned how to take a hit and get back up and stick to the plan. Yeah. And that's, and that's huge, the ability to take a hit and stick to the plan. Um, and, your, yeah, your first couple of hits, yeah, change your world. But after that, it becomes part, that's just the way the world is, and you know it. And the goddamn godly number of people that don't understand that the, excuse me, that the natural environment of a fight is to be pushed and pulled and slammed and hit, and that's just the way it is. It's ridiculous. No, you have something. Oh, you call one more thing. Yeah. oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, no. There's a, and one more thing. Um, when you're looking at your martial arts, and, and this is huge. This is something that um, I worked out when I was uh, doing a collaboration with Lawrence Kane. Um, high end self defense. You know, striking on up. You can only do. You can only justify because you're losing. Okay, and and this goes from everything from punching and kicking up to shooting. In order to justify it, you have to be in a position where you're losing, which means you have to train everything you do from ex- positions of extreme disadvantage. Because if, it, if it's even or better, like it is when you when you bow in and step forward, um, it's not justified. Which means you have to be able to work with with your structure compromised at a range you didn't choose, with the person behind you to the flank. Everything a bad guy's going to set up has to become your natural environment for fighting. That's critical. Absolutely, absolutely. Some of the stuff we would do is we'd have a we'd have a person, you know, demonstrate their ability to deliver a blow and then say, great, but now you're standing, you're prepared, you were asked, and we put them into a compromised position and say, now how would you deal with this? For instance, squatted to the ground, they're back against the wall with their, their you know, right shoulder pushed against the wall. You've got to do something now. What would you do? And that's another component that I have a problem with a lot of organized structured trainings is they always assume um, certain things are going to be in place or available or possible versus the reality of violence, which is you don't get to choose. That's a, uh, have you read the books? Cause that's, <laughs> no, I'm actually you don't book know. right now. I was going to start asking you to, to, to tell us a little yeah. bit about your books. I, I, I didn't realize you had written so many books, or uh, you kind of were referred by a listener, I, I, and uh, you got a ton of stuff. I, I didn't actually realize um, if you can't e-books, yeah, there's a ton. But the um, the uh, okay, so this is the pitching the books part of the show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hate yeah, but I mean, I think people would, could gain a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at. I thought, you know, maybe you had. I knew you had the the meditations on violence, but I'm looking at a whole uh, catalog of books here on your site. And uh, in fact, there's so many. Initially, I thought that um, maybe they were, you know, books you recommended. And then I started looking at the author name on all of them. So yeah, tell us about some of the writing you've done and what you have available. Um, um, the meditations on violence was the first one, and that was uh, um, really ugly year. Um, first body recovery was search and rescue, delivering a crack baby, um, uh, blew a hole in a guy. And on top of that, I was starting to realize how disconnected I was getting from the martial arts around me, that they didn't even have a language for what I was trying to say. And I'm getting some weird feedback on this right now. Um, so I started writing down, and it wasn't originally going to be published. It was just a, a booklet of the stuff I wanted my jiu-jitsu students to know when they were ready. And one of my friends, Chris Wilder, who I sent it to, sent it on to his publisher, and that's what started the whole ball rolling. So that was meditation. It's um, all the stuff that the martial arts I knew didn't seem to understand, the stuff that was obvious to me that wasn't obvious to them. Um, facing violence the second was about what to do about it. And that goes into self-defense law and internal ethics and how bad guys set up, which if you want more on social and asocial violence and the different types of social and asocial violence, 
that's the best breakdown I've done yet. Um, avoiding it, dealing with a uh, with ambush assaults, breaking the freeze, um, how fights differ from what most people expect, and a little bit on how to deal with the aftermath because it's never over. Um, then I got annoyed. <laughs> um, it, it, I, I I spent most of my time with the sheriff's office. I love these guys. They are incredibly efficient. They're very good. They're incredibly honorable. And it seemed like sometimes no matter what they did, um, someone who had absolutely no problem or no clue about what happened would be trying to judge it. And um, when I worked for the sheriff's office, I was working on behalf of the citizens. They have an absolute right to know exactly what I did, exactly why. Um, I'm doing. I'm using force on their behalf when I use force. But if someone wants to complain about it, I didn't want to complain because it made them feel icky, which is where most use of force complaints come from. I didn't like the way it looked. If you haven't been exposed to a lot of force, all force, every force event looks horrendous. Um, so I wanted to write a book because I didn't think there was one out there that did a good job of explaining the rules. So Force Decisions, a Citizen's Guide, the first half is um, a straight-up academy use of force class. And then there's some other stuff in there about how experience to change his perspective and some other things, but it's a guide to how cops think about force. Okay, and I think that's an important one because I think that, I don't know, I've seen excessive force, and I think that there's a level that we we know that's what we're looking at when we see it. I saw a Dallas police officer grab a 110-pound woman by the neck, pick her up, and slam her head into a concrete structure. That was clearly an excessive use of force. But I've also seen takedowns that you're absolutely correct that a person might say that that was excessive, but they have no idea what the threat to the officer might be. Well, and and one of the things I I run into a lot is that um, unless you've been exposed to it, a lot of people don't distinguish between pain and injury. Mm. And there are some things like like pepper spray and taser, which cause pain, but very, very rarely cause any significant injury. Um, Finger locking someone, which looks less horrible, is far more likely to cause a serious injury or permanent injury than either of those tools. But because they're tools, and especially the taser, the pain is so legendary, um, people don't recognize it's actually a lower level of force than tackling somebody. Sure, sure. So it's, um, yeah, it, so it, it's basically, you know, how we have to think about it in some of the case law. There was one, um, one local one, a uh, 260-pound guy walking in just pants in December on a windy bridge swinging a club. And the officer tried to talk to him, no response whatsoever, um, he drove, got out of the car with a taser, and the guy came at him swinging the club, so he tasered him. Okay. By the time it was done, the guy had done three taser shots and I think uh, four to six baton strikes before he got cuffs on the guy. 260-pound guy with a club. The officer would have been fully justified in shooting him. I would say um, so. I, 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 so yeah. right, he, he risked his life to handle it at a lower level of force, and the local community was up in arms because the 260-pound guy with the club was a 15-year-old child. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that sounds familiar to something else. I'm just going to leave alone right now. Yeah, but, but you get the idea. It's like you need to, yeah. you know, if you think that there's something wrong, you need to be able to explain what is wrong. And it's that was all I wanted was to have citizens have a book with the rules, so they could sit there and if they did have an issue with it, they could sit there and and have a, a, a conscious issue with it instead of a gut level issue with it. Now, you've got another book here that I'm interested in hearing about. Uh, horrible stories I told my children. Oh, I did that under a pseudonym, yeah. Yeah, you did. It's, it's uh, just R.A. R- R- Ellis. <laughs> well, I, I worked with criminals for so long, I didn't feel comfortable putting my uh, my kids' names out there. Sure. So I changed everybody else's names, but I figured I better change mine, too. So, um, no, I was, I was a terrible father. Oh, my God. My, my kids were convinced that they came from a kid pound, and if they, they weren't good, we could always take them back. <laughs> and it's like, you know... Uh, so it's, will you take us back? No, you're good kid. It's not like your older brother, Mikey. We don't have an older brother, Mikey. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I convinced their mother, Ben, that my mother-in-law, their grandmother, was a cannibal. Um, I told my daughter we, we stole her from a circus. <laughs> I was Okay, really, 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 really. I was looking for a point, right? So what was the point of that book? I, I thought it was going to be like, you know, horrible stories that were like because you were honest with them or something. So what was the No, what? no. I was just – I know I was – oh, no, I was a terrible dad. It was a uh, – one time – there were a couple times there was a point. One time my son, you know, he was just really mad at my wife. He's really mad at his mom. And I just mad at her. I hate her. And it's like, well, I knew this was coming. It looks like it's time to get ourselves a new mom. 
and he he's he's shocked, and it's like, <laughs> you know, so you want to help me write the ad? So I start composing this ad, you know, on a new mom. And, you know, the whole point is to get my kids to fight me on it. Sure. They did, but, it, but my daughter, I'm going to tell. It's like, oh, she'll look it out anyway Thursday. What's Thursday? Recycling day. You don't want me to just throw away. That wouldn't be ecologically sound. I'm going to put it out with recycling. <laughs> so, yes, I was not a good dad. Truly not a good dad. So, but what was, was the point of the book just to confess that, or just was it a humor book uh, with a twist of so, sense? I mean, what would a person who bought that book get out of it? Because I, I know what you'd get out of these other books. I I was interested in this, and now I don't know if I would want a copy. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you've got kids, you'll want a copy. Um, but it's those are just the stories, you know, now, now that they're adults, those are the stories my kids laugh their asses off about. Okay. Yeah. All right, so it's it's almost a Tim Taylor thing there. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, so where can people find out more?